Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Jason Berry. Uh, Grace Under Pressure is the show that focuses on the good stuff in life, which is too often dismissed, the caring, the commitment, the caring, the commitment, and the commitment and compassion we show toward others. And as you'll discover from Jason's life, he has been one who has sought to bring people together by telling the truth, sometimes the unpleasant truth. Um, and with that, I want to introduce you. Welcome, Jason Derry. So, Thank you, John. It's great to see you again and to be with you. Great. Well, Jason, you don't know I'm going to say this, but Jason and I go back way, way back to our college years. And Jason was a few years ahead of me and graduated. And he went on to the big, bold world. And he's the first person I know ever to have published a book. So he has been something of a hero to me. And I truly mean that because he's an exceptional reporter and writer and gifted storyteller. And so um, he's also the author of a book called the City of a Million Dreams, a History of New Orleans, and there's a documentary film which that he directed, uh, and that is we're going to show a clip of that later on in the show. Uh, Jason has been an extraordinary reporter, and, um, and his he first on one of the first reporters to uncover uh, the priest abuse of children in the Catholic Church. He wrote a book called Lead Us Not in Temptation, I believe it was 1992. And he's been covered in the media from Nightline, New York Times, you name it, uh, uh, Jason has been there. He's an exceptional com uh, and caring person, and it's such an honor to have you on the show. Welcome, Jason. John, it is a great pleasure, and thank you for those kind comments. Great. You um, have been doing this a long time <laughs> since our days at the Georgetown Voice, where I was a photographer and you are an editor with our dear departed friend and editor, uh, Steve Pasinski. So well, it's a shout out to Steve there. So, um, you know, you were among the first, if not the first, to investigate the priestly abuse of children. So um, and you wrote a book about it. What led you to investigate, Jason, and it cannot have been easy, so. It was not. Uh, toward the end of 1984, I had become a parent for the first time. My older daughter had just been born that December, and I got a lead uh, from a lawyer I knew uh, about a priest who had just recently been indicted for abusing altar boys out in Cajun country. And as it happened, I went to high school at Jesuit in New Orleans with one of the attorneys who had filed lawsuits against the Diocese of Lafayette. And he let me read the depositions of the bishop and other church officials. And, you know, I could, I could believe, I could understand that a priest, like anyone, could have some pathological illness. But when I read the cold printed words on paper, the bishop trying to explain why he had sent this priest on to assignment after assignment, I realized this is the story of a cover-up. This is outrageous. They never should have put this guy back in commission. So that's how it began. It was a series of articles. I had a joint assignment for the Times of Acadiana in Lafayette, Louisiana, and National Catholic Reporter, an independent weekly in Kansas City. And uh, the series... Uh, stretched out over the spring and into the summer and got a lot of national attention. And soon thereafter, I began working on the book that came out uh, six years, seven years later. Right. Well, recently you came back into my, my horizon more vividly with um, a video or documentary that the New York Times did. And I thought a New York Times doing a documentary on a reporter that's special. <laughs> that's like the new Nobel Prize Committee uh, talking about its members. So that's really cool. And they titled it Almost Famous. Where did that title come from? So. Uh, I, I don't know. I wish they dropped the almost, but I'll take <laughs> anything in the New York Times when it comes. Actually, the way it happened was a, a, a young woman called me. She worked for the production of Water Studios in Los Angeles, and she said, you know, we're doing this series of people almost famous. She said, I see you did a lot of reporting on the Catholic uh, Church crisis before the Boston Globe series in 2002. And I said, yes, indeed I did. 
So she asked me what I felt about that. And I said, well, I thought it was a very good series. She asked what I thought about the film. I said, I thought it was a great film, deserved the Academy Award. And uh, that's kind of how the preliminary conversation began. And eventually, Ben Proudfoot, the producer-director, uh, decided to do uh, a, a piece on me. Uh, we did a nine-hour interview, which I can assure you was quite daunting. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the piece he edited, I thought was, if I may, quite eloquent. And, and it, it was, it is a true, he handled is a, my story. Yeah. Well, truly, it should be shown in every journalism um, program because you t it, it, it gets to the real Jason uh, Barry. And from my perspective, the, your heart, your compassion, but also your doggedness and the resilience that such a reporter such as you, especially independent reporters like you, are up against. And, um, and I think it's interesting because I do remember vividly watching Spotlight and seeing your book shown right on there. And that was yeah. pretty darn cool. So what was the backstory between your book being in the actual movie so well the backstory is that one day i was sitting at my desk and i was working and mike resendez of the boston globe called me i knew everyone in the spotlight team in fact i i did a good deal of writing for the globe uh in their you know commentary pages that year and resendez called and said oh i need a favor and i said yeah sure what do you need and he said well you know uh, we're on the set right now and I, you know, I, I didn't know which set he meant. And I said, great, what, what, what are you doing? And he said, they're making a movie out of Spotlight. And I said, oh, terrific. And I guess I vaguely knew that. Anyway, they had called Doubleday to get permission to put the book on the cover, uh, you know, the book cover in the movie. And one of the lawyers for Doubleday said, no, no, you can't do that. Well, lawyers are trained to say no. And, I, uh, and he said, well, look, can you help us? And I said, yeah, don't listen to that lawyer. The rights reverted to me several years ago. Of course you can use the cover of the book. Would you send us an email? Sure, I'll send you an email. So I sent the email. They thanked me profusely. I hung up assuming, you know, I'll be on the cutting room floor. And then months later, I was at a reception at the New Orleans Museum of Art. And a woman came up to me and said, I saw the film. And I, I said, wonderful. What did you think? I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, what did yeah. you think? And she said, oh, I thought it was very well done. And they showed your cover in that movie. And then she said, I was at Telluride for the festival, which is kind of showing that you have a little stroke in life. Yeah. And uh, so I realized that, uh, I, you know, I had, I had made the final cut. And, and when I saw it, of course, I was delighted. Oh, that's great. That's great. Now I want to segue into your uh, project of the moment. You wrote a book a few years ago called City of a Million Dreams. So what led you to that? And the next step is the movie. And we're going to tease in our audience. We will show a clip in just a moment. So so tell us the backstory of that, Jason, please. Uh, so. the, the backstory, John, is that there have been two stories that have really defined my life as a writer the city of my birth and where I was born and raised and grew up and where I live today. Which and is New Orleans, which is New Orleans. Orleans. Yes, indeed. And the church in which I was raised and still struggle to remain a member of. Um, so I started following jazz funerals. One of my earlier books is a history of New Orleans rhythm and blues. And I began following jazz funerals. Oh, in the late nineties, um, <clears throat> I wondered where they came from. And the more I studied the story of burial traditions of the city, I realized that they held a mirror to the story of the city itself. And so the book uh, and the footage that I kept shooting was an overlapping project trying to uh, convey the history of New Orleans through these caravans of memory. Uh, the, funerals that the musicians played and tracing their origins back to a public park known as Congo Square, where enslaved Africans danced burial choreographies to the mother culture. So that's kind of how it began and, and took shape. Great. Well, let's jump in and let's show this clip right now, which I'm happy to do. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
celebrate the lack of death. We're sad because you're not here anymore. We're happy because you're going to better reward. <laughs> Else in the United States is going to let black people take over the streets, you know, every Sunday for four hours long. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> Someone dealing with American racism, trying to find a place in this life and society, you can be transformed into another world that really sets you free. Oh, this spirit goes back to Congo Square. Oh, Many of the slaves believed that when they died, they would go back to Africa. The groups that came here, music and funerals went together in all of these cultures. Gotta have music, gotta have a parade, gotta look good when you die. It's really a combination of European and African, which makes it American. But New Orleans has always been a hazardous place to live. It's hard to survive here. Before I leave here, I need to do what I can to repair the world. After Katrina hit, there was that question on the table, are we even going to fund rebuilding New Orleans? We need to hold on to our culture. That's the enduring lesson of the jazz funeral. Return again in another life, and it will be jubilant. We do this in their ancestral memory. That music and those experiences is what allow New Orleans to be the most African city in America. There we go. We're back. <laughs> My technical skills are not always the best. Oh, you're doing pretty good so far. Yeah. So, frankly, I have no idea what the other Okay. Um, anyway, excuse me. We're having a little bit of audio difficulty here. I apologize. Uh, great. There we go. Anyway, what a wonderful tribute. And it just opens with a bang. And it's, um, I'm watching it and I haven't seen the whole film yet, but I see uh, a sense of spirituality. Is, but all, the operative theme for me is hope. Am I correct in this, Jason? So, well, absolutely. Uh, Actually, the film is streaming over the next week at the Heartland uh, International Festival in Indianapolis. Uh, the, the viewers can link on and see it there. It will also be streaming um, in New Orleans um, uh, the November 5th to the 21st at the New Orleans uh, Film Festival. And it's also screening right now, I believe, at the Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. Virtually is the way a lot of festivals are doing it now. Sure. I had the great advantage of working with a brilliant editor, Tim Watson, whose fingerprints are on every frame in that film. And he lived it, he breathed it, and he worked closely with uh, my other co-producer, uh, Simonette Berry, my daughter, who uh, played a major role in orchestrating the Congo Square sequences that you saw. Mm -hmm. piece of. We also had a terrific executive producer, Bernard Pettengill, who was two years ahead of me at Jesuit High School and <laughs> came in when we really needed financing in the home stretch and oh, has, great. has been great shoulder to shoulder with us. Great. So, yeah, it's a story of, of redemption and uh, a belief that even when we die, we go to a better place. 
Right. Well, if there's any if there's any city which exemplifies uh, redemption, it has to be New Orleans. I mean, so many catastrophes just recently a, a hurricane there and of course Katrina. But the city doesn't die. And it doesn't it doesn't mean it just doesn't die. It has a vibrancy and a life to it. And by you shining a light on a tradition that most people, well, certainly me, didn't know exist. I knew about jazz funerals, right. but not Congo Square. So what a what a powerful story. So well, thank you. Uh, I think the city does have a life force. And you know. Many people the world over come here, spend a few days or a week or so, and they take away memories. But you have to live here over quite a period of time to really appreciate the resilience and also the social mosaic. I mean, this city is a crossroads of humanity. It was a melting pot long before the academic term was coined. And I think it stands today honestly, as a tribute to the best impulses of America, of people, you know, jazz is a metaphor of democracy, improvisational voices, finding a common melody. And I think the city uh, exemplifies that. Well, you've been writing about jazz for a long time, if I'm not mistaken. You were involved in some projects, what, 40 years ago or something? Something, whatever. So. Well, you date me, but I forgive you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, the, well, the book I did in 1986, Up from the Cradle of Jazz, uh, grew out of my first film, in fact, and it's a story of families and neighborhoods that created the post-war rhythm and blues sound, which includes the, the masking Indians, the Mardi Gras Indians, and we have yeah. a long sequence on them in this film. You know, I've been collecting the stories of people in, in this city for years, and I'm always fascinated by the way in which characters fate, as the Greeks, you know, uh, believe. And for so many people, there is a drive not just to survive these days with the elements seemingly against us, uh, but to celebrate and, uh, you know, to be thankful of what we have. And in a city like this, there's great food, good architecture, and the tradition of parading, which I think is a unifying factor uh, across the racial spectrum. Oh, no, that's powerful. And then I'm um, getting back to the jazz, and you had noted uh, improvisation. In my world of leadership and management, jazz is often referred to as something, uh, an insight into collaboration, because it's the, you have a set theme and then one goes uh, off and different instruments play there I mean, different musicians play different things but they all come back together and it's and the best musicians are those who are uh, generative you know and they talk about whoever it was you know uh miles davis or uh charles uh, excuse me john coltrane or uh charlie parker you know they like to share things and so that's germane to us and i think and and, and in your i'm just the little clip I've seen of this. There's a the humanity of this comes through, and you know we're we're different, but we're all united, are we not? And I like. <laughs> oh, I listen. This is music to my ears. The protagonist of this film, Dr. Michael White, is a uh, professor at Xavier University. He's done oh, something like two dozen CDs and albums, and he lost his home in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, it's a very powerful sequence in the film. Uh, I followed him the day he, he got home and went through with all of his intellectual capital as much underfoot. I mean, his compositions, his books, his CDs. And to follow someone like that as he recovered, not just recovered, but he rebuilt his career. He's, to my way of thinking, a kind of everyman. Uh, of New Orleans. And um, so working with him uh, was a great privilege. And I think the film reflects his role as a mirror of the larger uh, mosaic of the city. Well, you know, one, one of the themes of this show is uh, grace under pressure, which is the idea of keeping it calm and collected and, you know, being there for others. And, you know, the work that you've done, Jason, is akin to that in the sense that, 
you know, um, you've tackled tough stories. The two things that you're, you know, the jazz stuff, which is powerful in your city that you have love for, but also the Catholic Church, which I sense you have a degree of love for. But yet sometimes the best form of love is you have to speak truth to power. And you've certainly been doing that for a long time. And a lot of people, I'm sure you wish you would just go away. So how do you steal yourself for that, Jason? So. Uh. Oh, well, I, I listen to a lot of music. <laughs> I try to find good Bordeaux red, you know, for the stolen moments. Um, yeah, you know, there was a period, oh, in the mid-90s when well, I was not exactly the most popular person in the Catholic Church. But after the Boston Globe series, as my books started to get wider circulation, I think a lot of people realized I was kind of the canary in the coal mine, if you will. And um, I do think Pope Francis uh, has a reform agenda and he's following it. And Well, he's a Jesuit, of course. <laughs> well, I, I went to Jesuit high school. I cannot speak ill of a Jesuit. Uh, Same but he hasn't given me an yeah. interview yet, so we hold out that hope. You know, there's, hope is always eternal. No, but I think his agenda of radical mercy is uh, is prophetic, you know, the idea that that we cannot let migrants simply fall off the face of the earth. We have to think about a way of welcoming them, as Angela Merkel did as the chancellor of Germany. And, um, you know, there is a dimension of that in this film, because one of the characters in this film is a woman named uh, Deb Cotton, who uh, was shot uh, at a at a, at a parade and what she manifested toward the young men who were arrested is a, a very moving sequence in this film. And, you know, parading is a metaphor of life in my view and parading with music as we have done historically in the city is a, a, a way of telling the story of the city. Um, and I, I hope that that, form of grace uh, has a certain arc and transcendence that viewers of this film and the people who read the book uh, will embrace. Well, I mean, certainly when you see the concept of, of parades and you know, the verb you made there, gerund, you made it, <laughs> parading, um, that's a form of community, is it not? And it's an open oh, manifestation true. of I'm here together with my brethren or sisterhood and all of that. So that's very much in the concept of grace, which is that commonality that binds us together. So yeah. I think you've put it quite, quite beautifully. Uh, of course, it's my show. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I'm the guest and you're not paying. <laughs> but, uh, you know, parading is a tradition in New Orleans that, that spans the many peoples who have come here. Rex, the king of Mardi Gras, typically a civic leader, follows uh, on Carnival Day the crew of Zulu, which is the African-American uh, parade. And there are parades in, in many of the neighborhoods. And I think what draws people to the streets, to the music, to the cadences, and certainly the costumes, is uh, a celebration of the better angels of our nature. To bring in President Lincoln, one of my favorites. So uh, that's good. Uh, but anyway, and as you go forward in this, I mean, uh, when people come to New Orleans, they like it for its charm, its food, and stuff like that. But you know, you you said it takes a long time to understand the city, and so. Um, t and, and I'm, I'm going to ask a dumb question, but I mean, people from the outside is. Given the rising levels of sea level, does New Orleans have a future? So uh, what do the people of New Orleans think about climate change? So, Well, when they're not parading, <laughs> we think a lot about it. Well, the levees held this time with Hurricane Ida. Uh, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers did a $15 billion uh, rebuilding of the levees after Hurricane Katrina. You know, these are issues that many communities face today. And uh, I think we're at the beginning of a long road. We need restoration of the coastal wetlands uh, offshore to the south of the city. 
And by the same token, many of the communities that lie between New Orleans and the Gulf of Mexico, Homa, Thibodeau, and many of the smaller towns um, along those roads are facing a kind of existential crisis. And it is a moment that begs for principled leadership. And I think we all keep our shoulder to the wheel and hope that we can push to get the right solutions. Well, I think your film is going to shine a very positive life on the traditions of New Orleans and its environs. And that can only be a good thing. You know, let's save this for what it is. It's such a unique city and it's so different. So anyway, we're coming kind of coming to the end of our show, Jason, and um, viewers know that I always ask uh, someone a story of grace. And I know you have one to share with us, Jason. So. Well, I guess the story of grace I would share um, has to do with my younger daughter, Ariel, who had Down syndrome and uh, had heart and lung issues and was with us for 17 years and manifested a joy of living that touched her mother, her sister, all of the grandmothers, the aunt, both of the grandmothers, aunts yeah. and uncles. And yesterday was her birthday. She would have been uh, 30. Mm -hmm. Although we miss her, her spirit lives with us. Oh, that's great. And what a wonderful story of, uh, of that and Grace. And, and I would say the work that you do is, is someone, uh, Grace is that ability to come together. It's a catalyst for the greater good, as you probably know from our good judgment <laughs> that taught us. And maybe it went over my head, but probably not yours, Jason. <laughs> 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 men for others, men yeah. and women for others, I think is now the phrase. Is more men yeah. women getting just what it is. But in, you know, in the work, I, I, I am an admirer of what the, all the great work that you have done because you are a, 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 an ancillary to grace that is often not known in its courage. And I know in your work, it's not easy what you have done. And um, to keep doing it year after year, decade after decade, and it's wonderful now that you have this, this celebratory story to tell. Um, that's great. So, uh, Jason, it's been such a treat to have you on the show. And how can people find you? So, uh, My website is jasonberryauthor.com. And the film website is cityofamilliondreams.com. Uh, please pay us a visit. Great. Well, we will put those in the notes. And Jason, it has been an honor to have you on the show. And with that, I'm going to close out. So uh, thank you.